We uh, are on part two of the patriarchal priesthood of Job. We believe that Job was a tremendous uh, individual, a great believer, listed amongst the who's who, and rightly so, of uh, the um, uh, great believers of all time in the Bible. And we have been going through and looking at some things that uh, other people have said with regard to Job. We saw the author of the book of Job, who, of course, was inspired by God the Holy Spirit. And then we noted here in uh, point number two what God said about him. That's where we are. God called him my servant, uh, one that he possesses, one that he is proud of, one that he's not ashamed to name as an example among the angels and others, a one who endured tremendous testing, but did not commit, generally speaking, any verbal or attitudinal sins. Now, uh, sometimes um, when we go through testing, and I'm speaking for myself, I may not say it, but down deep on the inside, it's a churning. Uh, you know, you, you want to say, oh, Lord, you become a little bitter. Why is this happening to me? Well, I've done it right. And Job isn't God's answer to us regarding that. Here was a man who did it right. <laughs> There wasn't anything wrong with Job. He didn't, you know, he didn't deserve what he was going through, and yet he went through it happily, says the scripture, at least to the third evidence test, and uh, God commends him. Now, the second time he commends him, again in verse 8, it says that Job here is without equal in his day. Verse 8 says that there is none like him in the earth. God also says it in verse number three, and these are um, uh, parallel verses, but verse three here in chapter two adds a little more information. There's none like him in the earth. Now, here is a tremendous statement regarding the character of Job when compared to others. We've already seen what the author of the book of Job says about him. Verse number three of chapter one says, he was the greatest of all men of the East. And that verse there means comparatively and collectively. And it uh, puts a, a unique uh, a viewpoint or perspective on it when you figure that what this guy is doing is adding up all of the virtues and all of the good attributes and characteristics of all the people living at that time. He adds them together and he puts this total over here and then he puts one man on the opposite side, Job. And he says, this guy is greater than all of them put together. And uh, uh, that is a tremendous testimony. Well, that's what God says about him. We know that what the author said is true because God says, as he is living in that day on the earth, there's none like him. He is without peer. He's without equal. Uh, nobody can match up to Job in God's estimation. And so that's a, a pretty good testimony. I uh, had um, one after uh, the service to say, boy, if we could just live up to Job. And of course, that, that's the thing. That is our objective. Being like Christ means that we have to go through all of the turmoil, all of the troubles, all of the uh, uh, maturity factors, which means experiencing tribulations. Tribulation work with patience. We need patience like Job. The only way to get patience is to go through the tribulation. Uh, we wish we could just get it without doing it. But that's one of those things that you cannot have without going through the experience itself. And so Job did that. And God says uh, that um, he is incomparable compared to all. Now, in verse number three of chapter two, we have some added information that, uh, that God gives us about Job. And I think it's important to consider it because it speaks even more volumes regarding the character of this man. And I cannot speak too highly of him. Uh, chapter two, verse three. The last part of verse three says, Still, he holds fast his integrity. Now, the word integrity there is tuma, and it means to be completely loyal to the truth in all categories, in all areas. That's actually what integrity is. We sing in our church services, especially when we get highfalutin. Uh, we sing the uh, 
the doxology. And then also we sing, holy, holy, holy. Well, the word holy is much better than the word integrity, but that's exactly what it means. We couldn't sing integrity, integrity, but it, it does <laughs> flow a little smoother when we sing holy, holy, holy. We're, we're glad for the, the word. But holiness is just a synonym for the integrity of God. Um, one attribute does not compromise the other attribute. Everything works together in total righteousness and justice. And righteousness and justice, uh, in the absolute sense, put together, equals holiness or integrity. And this man had achieved a measure of spiritual maturity, so much so that uh, that his right hand knew what his left hand was doing. And it matched, it coalesced, it dovetailed. So much that God called it integrity that pleases me with his life. Now, uh, that included all areas. And that's fantastic because God himself says, uh, look, you, you made me put him through it, and yet he's holding fast his integrity. He'll not curse me. He's not getting bitter at me. Uh, what's the matter, Satan? You weren't able to, um, to budge him, were you? Now, let's note the next thing uh, that God says, and it's very important. Although you moved me against him, and then to destroy him without cause. And uh, that particular word cause there, uh, kinam in the Hebrew, it means for no reason or undeservedly. Now, what are we talking about here? Job's character. And the fact that there are some who say that in the very first chapter that Job is sinning, that Job is wrong, uh, that Job doesn't measure up, that somehow... Um, uh, Job, uh, with all of these accolades going out to him, was really beneath the surface, uh, not what he appeared to be. But with all of these testimonies we've got with regard to Job, Job was uh, a perfect man and an upright man. God said, now, if he had deserved what Satan put him through or with God, what God allowed, God would have said he, he justly got what he deserved. But what did God say? You moved me against him to destroy him without cause. Kenam. For no reason. Undeservedly. Uh, it was just simply an action in the angelic conflict where I had to trim away the hedge and allow you to get at him in order to prove a point. His um, uh, flawless character. His impeccable nature. And then, of course, the last part, point E here, where it says, Job has spoken that which is right. Now, we've already been there several times back in uh, Job uh, 42, 7. But uh, three times we read where God said, My servant Job has spoken that thing which is right of me. And so again, it's God's testimony of Job saying that on the inside with his attitude, on the outside with his mouth, Job was right with God. Now, there are a couple other witnesses here who probably would not have been um, uh, real happy to know that they were going to be called upon to witness for the character of Job. And one, of course, was his wife. Uh, Job chapter 2 and verse number 9. Now, you will remember, as we just read in verse 3 of this chapter, the issue is Job's perfection or his integrity. The fact that he will not budge, he will not yield, even though God is unjustly allowing him to be put to the test. And uh, it's, it's, God's going to turn it all around and be just to the man of the long run and restore him twofold. And we've been looking at these witnesses. We're calling them up front and center. The Holy Spirit, the author of the book. Here comes God. He testifies about Job. And now here comes someone who probably wouldn't want to be called as a witness as to the character of Job. Why? Because she was trying to get him to, <laughs> to default. She was trying to get him to give in. Verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Do you still... Retain your integrity. Curse God and die. Now, the point that we're looking at here is not necessarily that she's trying to get him to yield to a satanic cause, and she is. 
to get him to simply tell, uh, tell God. And that's what the word curse means. We looked at it to tell God literally go to hell. Get out of my life. Get out of my face. Uh, I'm not going to obey you. Um, no to God. Become a practical atheist. Know that there is a God, but absolutely tell him no and act as though there were not one. That's what she wanted him to do. But the point that we're trying to get at here is we're witnessing for his character. How do we know that he still was uh, flawless as to his position for God? She said, do you still retain your integrity? In other words, she's witnessing for him, even though I know she was, if, if, <laughs> she wouldn't like it if we told her so. But she's letting us know that this guy had been put through two evidence tests, the loss of his wealth, the loss of his health, and he still was holding on to his integrity for God. He still said, look, I'm not going to blame God for all of this. Uh, it's, it, we're going to receive good from the hand of God in the angelic conflict. We're going to receive bad from the hand of God. And that's something we have to understand. So that in all this, it says in verse 10, Job did not sin with his lips. The second thing that she tells us is that he did not curse God uh, up to that particular point. He was not telling God where to get off. Now, another unseemly a witness would be that of Lucifer himself. And uh, let's come back to um, chapter 1 and verse 9. This is tremendous. We have the book of Job opening up behind the scenes and allowing us to see what's going on there, what people are saying about this man. And the whole point of the angelic conflict is to allow Lucifer to get the goods on somebody. Did you, ever, did, you ever, did you ever hear somebody say about somebody else, well, I've got something on them. Oh, well, they'll never do this because I've got, got something on them, you know. Uh, it's one of those political things. Well, if they do go this way, then I'll tell them and sort of bribery and blackmail and that sort of thing. Well, the whole point of God allowing for the testing was for God to allow Lucifer to get something on him, to find that crack in his character, to be able to work on his weakness and work on his weakness until finally Job said, okay, okay, enough is already. I can't stand that anymore. I'll curse God and die. And the fact is that we have at least two instances, and the third is is uh, is obvious, but it's um, not spoken a whole lot of after these first few chapters, and that's the uh, third evidence test of the silence of God. But, but Job held true for all three. How do we know? Because after the test was completed, Lucifer could not say, I got him to sin. Lucifer is a witness to the character of Job. He brought accusations against Job but he did not bring proof of any wrongdoing. That's how we know that Job was a righteous man. Satan answered the Lord and says, Does Job fear God for nothing? This is the accusation. You've made a hedge about him. Operation hedge in, 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 a, in a threefold manner. At three evidence tests. About his house. And about all that he has on every side. And thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased. Put forth your hand now, and touch all that he has. He'll curse you to your face. And the other one is in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Put forth your hand now, touch his bone and flesh, he'll curse thee to your face. God allowed Satan to get to Job. And the point that we're uh, uh, trying to make right here is that despite his accusations, there is not one verse of Scripture which says that Satan came marching right into the presence of God and said, here's this guy that you're so proud of. There is no uh, evidence that Lucifer found any flaw in his character. He held out for God. And that is amazing and that is fantastic. Um, and it is, um, it is absolutely unusual. Okay, now we're going to move on here to Job's relationship with his children. Let's see. Well, the light is 
bad, but you've got a, a copy of it, and when it's a little darker, you can see. Um, but I want to take you back up to verse number 10 of chapter 1. Because from here until the end of this study, we're going to be talking about priesthoods. And the reason we're going to talk about it is because of, of the question. You talk about the patience of Job. I, I do. I get impatient. As, as, you know, here we're standing for the grace message. We're struggling it out. We're in the trenches. We're fighting for the Lord, fighting for more than just a right gospel, but for right doctrine subsequent to that. And then, then the folks will say, well, now this is not right and that is not right. And who, who should know better? And the charge was made. Job's not so hot. He's not so good. Um, it was more or less, uh, well, you teach there, your pastor teaches, that uh, the Job was a perfect man. And this pastor says, well, look here, Job sinned. And again, at the first hour we explained, we did not mean sinless perfection. And it's obvious that we did not mean that. We mean what the Bible means, and that is he attained a measure of spiritual maturity and integrity. Now, what was he doing offering sacrifices. I thought only priests could offer sacrifices. And the people that say these things do not understand that before the Levitical priesthood was established, there was another priesthood. And that priesthood was vested in the heads of a household. So much so, as we will see as we peruse through these verses, that salvation was linked to a house and it was linked to the head of the house and you could not get saved unless you uh, went to the um, head of that house and went through him to that man's God, which was the God of the Bible. Now, I'm not talking about a false God here. I'm talking about a true God. And if the head of the house was worshiping a false God, you broke from the head of that house. This is where the fourfold curse comes in in, in the, the Ten Commandments. Up until the uh, third and fourth generation of them that hate me. How can the fourfold curse be broken? You leave your father's house. You get out of there. And, uh, and you establish a relationship with, with the true and living God. And then your lineal descendants and the servants under your care come to you, literally, to go through you as a mediator and an advocate to, to worship God. Now, uh, I, I see that this may be a strange concept to you because we, we study here and you, all you hear people giving the gospel. And uh, that, that uh, you can just be saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the answer to that is, of course, yes, but that's this dis dispensation. You could not do that in past dispensations without associating yourself with the house of the man that God appointed and he blessed. And that's exactly what Job was doing. He was acting as a patriarchal priest. Obviously, he was God's man. None greater, none like him. Uh, uh, he's he's going to pray for you. Uh, you go there and you offer your sacrifices in the presence of Job. Now, the concept of household salvation involves the man, basically his lineal descendants, and then any servants and their families within his boundaries. So let's look at verse number 10. Note what it says. Have you not made a hedge about him, and note this phrase, about his house, and note this phrase, and about all that he has on every side? You see, the influence of Job, here's one man who had the hedge about him, but because others were associated with him, the hedge went around them too, and then everything in his house, which in his estate, uh, which he influenced and controlled, he had a hedge about that. Him his, his household, and then all of his estate had a hedge about it. 
God allowed Satan to remove all three hedges to get to him, and still uh, he stayed true to the Lord for the most part, except for the third evidence test. But what we're talking about here is Job, as the patriarchal priest, was able to stand the test between Satan and himself and his periphery by being true to the Lord. Now, that's what he was doing for his children, as we will see. Verse number four. Where it says, And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for the three sisters to eat and to drink with them. Verse number 13. There was a day when his sons and the daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And we're going to stop there with the, these two uh, verses and, uh, and make some comments. The first thing we want to note is that uh, I believe that Job's children were of the partying sort. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were unbelievers. It's just that they perhaps did not share all that, um, all that Job shared with regard to a spiritual heritage. But they still, at least nominally, stayed there. Why? Why did they stay with Job? Number one, he had more substance than everyone put together. And if they stayed with Job, that meant when he kicked the bucket, they were going to receive the inheritance. Excuse the phrase, that's just exactly what it is. But, um, you know, even these folks had to be influenced by this man, Job. Now, unless you say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't seem fair, I would refer you to the Levitical priesthood of, of Israel. There were unbelievers, carnal believers, and spiritual believers, all three types, that were preserved by the function of the high priest of Israel as their mediator and advocate. Uh, most of Israel did not want to live for the Lord, and yet God protected them, generally speaking. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, you know, and, and, and delivers them. Why did he do this? Simply because of the function of the Aaronic priesthood or Levitical priesthood. And therefore, Job could do the very same thing. As long as they were associated with Job and at least went through the motions, they were going to be blessed of, of his ministry. And uh, so it says, Verse 4 again, and his sons went and feasted in their houses. Each one of these men had a house. Everyone his day, probably means here everyone on his birthday. In other words, they were, <laughs> oh boy, we got another birthday coming up. Uh, order everything necessary for the party. We're going to take our turns at each of our houses. And they called for the three sisters to eat and drink with them. And that's what's going on in verse number 13. It says they were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. Now, the significance of this is twofold. It meant that it was his eldest son's birthday in all probability. And secondly, it meant that when judgment fell, verse 18, while they were yet speaking, another came, said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. There came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. It fell upon the young men and they're dead. I'm the only one escaped to tell you. He got his heir. The one in the actuality that he would transfer the patriarchal priesthood to. Now, Job has a, has a twofold problem here. Number one, his heir is supposed to take care of him in his old age. That's the way it was in that particular society. As they got old, the, the older would transfer the wealth and the power to the eldest son, and the eldest son would begin running the estate with the father preserved with the wealth that he had uh, accumulated during his life. So he got his heir, the guy who's supposed to take care of Job. That's all gone. His, his wealth and anybody who cares about him, who can do anything, is all gone. But secondly, Satan stopped the transfer of the patriarchal priesthood. 
He has no heir with which to say, okay, now look, I've been doing this for you all, all this time. Now it's your turn to do it to me. Now, Job was, um, Job was, uh, restored in the end. He got his sons and daughters back. So he got an heir back to that particular office. But, um, this is what happened. So, but now, why did this happen? Remember, it's part of Operation Hedge, evidence testing, the removal of the hedge. What was Job doing in sacrificing for his sons and his daughters? Keeping the fort up, keeping the hedge up, keeping the buffer zone, the protective barrier up between Satan and his children and between God's judgment and his children. As long as their sins were covered under the blood through his priesthood, they were safe. At least say, and that of course is the, the uh, household concept. As long as you're in the house, you're safe until you're saved. And that's the whole point. It's, uh, it's, it's not like us today. We're, we have total grace as our salvation. But with them, it is. You're safe in your identification with the patriarchal priest. All right. So let's look and see then what Job was, was doing. We're in the back. We're in the second paragraph. You're following in our, our, our outline. And uh, we will get to running some of these verses a little bit later on. But we want to do a little bit of exegesis. Now, what is exegesis? It's going into the depth of the scripture and bringing out its true meaning. What is eisegesis? It is reading your own interpretation into the scripture. What do the people who, who said, well, now they're not teaching right. What are they doing when they say Job was wrong in what he did in this verse? That's eisegesis. That's reading back what uh, what they think the scripture says because of all the things that the scripture says pertaining to fatherhood and priesthood and, and so forth in our day and age. Job lived thousands of years ago under another dispensation, under another economy. That's what he was doing. We don't have dads doing that today. Uh, calling <laughs> calling their children, sending them emails, uh, st- sending a telegraph and what have you. We're going to meet at such and such a time here at the house and we're going to have us a good old fashioned burnt offering. And uh, you've got to come here and, uh, you know, uh, that, that's what it is. Just come on. We're going to do this. Dads don't do that today. Why? There is no such thing as a patriarchal pre- priesthood today. Now, however, there are some similarities. And ye fathers, bring them up in the what? Nurture and admonition of the Lord. There is a similarity there. There is a responsibility of dads to bring his household up in what God requires for today. But it is unlike Job's priesthood. All right. So let's read. And so it was, verse 5. When the days of their feasting were gone about, literally run their course, went through their cycle. In other words, have birthday one, then have burnt offering one. <laughs> birthday two, it's the, it's the cycle of things. After, after all of this, there was, and we'll show you that at the end of the verse here as well. Uh, things would happen and Job would say, okay, well now we've got to take care of this. Why? Verse uh, 5 again, last part of the verse. Now here's an interesting insight on something that Job's friends did not do to Job. What did Job's friends do? They accused him without evidence. They charged him without a confession. They twisted his arm more or less so that he would fess up, as it were, uh, and uh, didn't have to, you know, call a special prosecutor, an independent counsel in order to get uh, a confession. Job, they, they wanted that with, with Job. We'll 
We'll do our best to get you to admit that you are a bad, evil man. God does not judge good men. God judged you, and therefore you have to be bad. And they didn't understand the angelic conflict. All right. What did Job give them that they, they sh- his children, that his friends should have given him? Benefit of the doubt. It may be that my sons have sinned and curse God in their hearts. In other words, I'm doing this, I'm calling them uh, to church and going through these rituals because they might have fallen short and they might have told God where to get off. I'm going to hold them to account. For some reason, these other folks want to say that Job uh, was really not doing uh, correct, was just letting his children off the hook. He was not. He was calling them into account. A burnt offering is a sin offering. Uh, a burnt offering is, a, is, you put it on there, you identify it, you slit the throat of the thing, and you totally consume it for, with regard to sin. It may be that my children sin. I don't know that for sure, but I'll tell you what, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call them front and center, and, and we're going to uh, go through these motions at least to find out, curse God in their heart. So he's acting as a patriarchal priest. So what did he do? Note the word sent. When their days of feasting were gone about, in other words, they went through the cycle. Job sent. It is the Hebrew word shalak. Now remember, he was the patriarch, and the concept of the patriarchal priesthood is that the head of the household and primarily his lineal descendants, those biologically related to him, were represented by him, though others will be, as we'll see. He sent. Now, remember we were talking about how that uh, this, this refers to after one birthday party and another birthday party and another birthday party. <laughs> you, you wouldn't want to be a cow <laughs> in their day for, for these bird offerings. The Hebrew stem is a cow spelled differently, imperfect. The imperfect means an incompleted action. It simply means that Job was never complete in offering sacrifices for his children. They no sooner had a birthday than he was calling them back to the sacrifice. That's what he was doing. Now, this is not the attitude of an unspiritual man. This is an attitude of somebody somebody who was fully responsible for his position and function and knew what he was doing. You're going to have a party. You're going to be back in my house, my my house, my tent, uh, offering to my God, and that's the way it's going to be. And the imperfect says that the action was incomplete. He did it every time. But more than that, it's in what's called the wild consecutive construct. Now, that simply means that it sets... Uh, uh, as it were, the cause of the action, uh, the one causing the action, even closer to the verb, so that it gives the impression that he was personally responsible for it. It was the patriarch who called his family. He went and sent for them. He took it upon himself, in other words, and the imperfect, he did this on a routine basis. Every time they had a birthday, every time they had a, a party, I guess <laughs> I guess that's where you get the term rounder. Uh, I don't know, but uh, as they went through their cycle of birthdays, every time he called them back front and center to, to the altar where their sins were going to be represented and judged if they did sin. He didn't want any, um, any problem caused internally so that God himself would take down the hedge. He wanted the hedge up. Of course, it went down for the testing. But this simply means that he himself personally sought to it that his children were contacted for this spiritual ceremony. Now, what is the second thing he did? Note in verse 5, Job sent and sanctified them. Kadosh, or it can be Kadosh or some derivative of this. And it means to set apart. 
Now, in the context, uh, the word has to be used in context. Here, obviously, it's being set apart for whom? God. I'm going to set them apart. Why? Because they may have sinned, fallen short. They may have gone astray, cursed God. And, uh, and I'm going to bring them back under the blood, as it were. I'm going to set them apart. And that's what it means. When you're under the blood of the, of the sacrifice, then God sees the sacrifice that paid for your sins first. And you're beneath. And of course, that's the concept of Christ dying for us. We're under the blood. We're under his sacrifice. God smote Christ first and only. We're safe beneath the blood. And so what did he do? I'm going to sanctify them. I'm going to be, bring them back under the protective barrier between God's judgment and their sin. And God is going to judge the sin in the sacrifice, the substitutionary sacrifice. The PL stem here means that that is something that uh, is intentional. Something he intentionally did. He was not uh, uh, acting as a man who said, I'm just going to let my children go. He was acting as somebody who was going to fully uh, call his children into account. Again here, we have... The wild consecutive construct, which means that it's something that he himself intentionally, the imperfect, continually brought about, setting them apart. But here's something very unusual as well. On the back part of this verb, we've got a third uh, person masculine plural suffix. So these, these two things, the prefix, the suffix, and the verb closely held together in the the spelling of the Hebrew. It means that he intentionally sanctified them, and it's a specific group in mind, his children. It's all attached in that one word there. And if his children were going to not be at the service today, guess who they had to answer to? Job himself. And that all of these functions are priestly functions. And that's how he is acting as a patriarchal priest. He sent for them. He did it on a continual basis. They came and he put them under the blood. And he did so in, in such a way that he intentionally brought it out. But that's where they were going to be. You're either going to be under the blood in this estate and in this house, or you're going to be outside the boundaries of the hedge. So it's either or you choose. You want to be in my protective custody? Then you're going to be in church and you're going to be under the blood. If not, you're going to be out the door, out the gate, uh, trimming the hedge and slam the gate behind you, whatever. I don't know. Okay, let's move on here. Let's go to the word offered. So when the days of their feasting were gone about, Job sent and sanctified them, rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings. Now, the word offered there is Allah. This is in the Hifil perfect. Now, the Hifil is causative active. Perfect is to bring about a completed state. And so that's what he was doing. See, when you go to the original language, put these words in the context, look around about at what he was doing. When he offered that sacrifice and called them to be under the blood, he offered them for that specific purpose. He offered it in order to, he caused it to, to be brought about. And we know that it was accomplished because of the, the perfect tense. It was a completed action. They were brought under the blood each and every time he offered this sacrifice. Now, they themselves may not have, have been perfect, but under the concept of the patriarchal priesthood, he brought them under the blood, at least they were safe until they themselves got saved. That's household salvation. That's what it's called. And we'll see time and again tonight how that the word house is used with regard to a person's salvation and a, the name father or the title father is used to go back to for our salvation or spirituality. Okay, we're still here in verse 5. I know what you're thinking. Pastor, curse God and die. Get it over with. No, we still... 
I'm not going to give up the ghost just yet. Okay. The last part of verse 5. This did Job continually. From everlasting to everlasting, uh, thou art God. Things in a cycle. This particular word here, yom, means seasonally, uh, cyclically. Of course, if you were cool back in the days when Harley Hogs, you called them sickles. Uh, but I think the, the proper terminology is a cycle. But it's something unusual about this particular con construction, too, and it's very important in the Hebrew to see just how devoted a father was to his children. This guy was committed. He himself was consecrated to this task on behalf of his children. He was not irresponsible. Note yom, noun masculine singular, as construct, with a definite article and a noun masculine plural. Again, the, the words here are scrunched as it were. You, you hear today in uh, uh, terminology, we're going to crunch the numbers, we're going to scrunch uh, uh, the image in the computer. And that's what they're doing here. They're scrunching it. And it literally means, not just continually, but throughout the cycle of years. He did it this year and this year and this year and this year and this year continually. He didn't give up on them. That's the whole point. As long as they were within his jurisdiction, they were going to be in his church and he was going to place them under the blood and keep them safe until they themselves could get saved or die and go to hell, one or the other. And here was a man who was, um, was thoroughly obligated um, uh, and given over to this obligation of representing his children before God. Now, these particular comments, and we're through. That's what a patriarchal priest was. Now, not all dads were patriarchal priests. <laughs> it's I'm beginning to slur my words here. Uh, not all dads were. But believing dads were. And especially spiritually mature believing dads were. And as the patriarchal priest, he brought God and his family together in himself. That is known as being a mediator. And that's what he was doing to his family. And that is also known as being an advocate. And that's what he was doing to his family. He was representing them so that God and man could be brought together. And he was telling God, yes, they did this, but I've offered this sacrifice. And therefore, I ask that you not judge them. And that's exactly we read in chapter 42 as we're closing this out. In chapter 42, he told Job's friends, get the burnt offerings, go to Job, offer these things. For Job, I will accept, and he'll pray for you, and I will not deal with you after your folly. I won't deal with you after your particular sins. And Job, therefore, was acting uh, in a bona fide fashion as a patriarchal priest.